What's up guys? Welcome back. I think this is part four of this series on Matt Stoller's article about how Democrats killed their populist soul. We've talked about the New Deal Democrats that, uh, you know, that did the New Deal and all that sort of stuff. And we talked about how things, uh, how the Watergate babies came in and, and totally upended the political order they'd created and started a new one. Now we're going to be talking about the Clinton presidency, so strap in. Uh, when Bill Clinton took office as the 42nd president, the Watergate babies would finally have their chance to govern. Clinton wasn't in public office in 1975. He lost his first political election in 74 in a close race in Arkansas for a congressional seat. But he was, in all other respects, a Watergate baby. Like the Watergate class, Clinton had worked for McGovern, he avoided service in Vietnam due to higher education, he was featured in Rothenberg's The Neoliberals for his work on education reform, and he read The Washington Monthly. Clinton Democrats eventually came to reflect Dutton's political formulation. This was the guy who argued, you know, the leave the white working class behind a, a couple videos ago. Uh, these guys were more diverse and Clinton's, Clinton Democrats were more diverse and less reliant on the white working class. His administration looked like America, with women, African Americans, Latinos, and gays, and lesbians represented. And most were educated at top universities. Oh shit, sorry guys, let me turn off this fan. I meant to do that, sorry if it was bothering you in the background. Uh, do -do -do. Clinton stripped antitrust out of the Democratic platform. It was the first time a reference to monopoly power was not in the platform since 1880. Globalization, deregulation, and balanced budgets would animate Clinton's political economy with high tech and finance leading the way. So yeah, the realization of, of the Watergate baby dream, all the things we've been talking about coming to, 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 coming to be right here. And it seemed to work. From 1993 to 2001, GDP growth averaged 4%, up from 2.8% from 1981 to 1993. The median family income increased by $6,000, with the lowest inflation rate since the 1960s. Plus, 22 million jobs were created, 7 million people came out of poverty, America saw the highest home ownership rate ever, the national debt nearly disappeared, and interest rates came down. African Americans experienced pay increases for the first time since the 1960s. Goldman Sachs called it the best economy ever. And Business Week lauded a new age economy of technical innovation and rising productivity. The administration put this additional fat of the land toward third world debt relief, student aid, empowerment zones, and community block grants. When George, Bush, when George W. Bush came into office after Clinton, the Onion's headline read, Bush, quote, our long national nightmare of peace and prosperity is over. I didn't realize The Onion was that old, actually, that they were, you know, around in, in 2001. I guess it makes sense, but yeah, good for them. So yeah, so, you know, seems like everything's going great. Nothing to, nothing to worry about. Everything's perfect. We've solved economy. You know, we've solved politic. We've solved government. It's the end of history. We figured it all out. America's the only superpower. Capitalism is the only viable ideology. We're just going to gallop off into the future in the best economy ever doing all this Watergate baby bullshit. What the fuck, haters? Why are you, why you complaining? Everything's perfect. At the end of his presidency, Clinton explained his success. He praised Greenspan's stewardship of the Federal Reserve. He said that the key to non-inflationary growth was ensuring that workers did not demand raises beyond the rate of productivity while unleashing business to pursue the most profitable lines of investment through deregulation and globalization. He implicitly touted the theory of capital shortage. Inflation resulted from overregulation and deficits, which took money out of the hands of businesses. Putting money and power back into the hands of businesses with deregulation and a balanced budget led to low interest rates, massive corporate profits, productivity growth, and broad prosperity. Bork and Thoreau, in other words, were right. See? Clinton's policy framework diverged with that of his Republican predecessors in many ways, not just on social policy, but also on raising marginal tax rates on the wealthy. In terms of concentrations of power in the private sector, however, it was more a completion of what Reagan did than a repudiation of it. From telecommunications to media to oil to banking to trade, 
Clinton administration officials, believing that technology and market forces alone would disrupt monopolies, ended up massively concentrating power in the corporate sector. They did this through active policy, repealing Glass-Steagall, expanding trade through NAFTA, and welcoming China's entrance into the global trading order via the World Trade, or World trade Organization. But corporate concentration also occurred in less examined ways, like through the Supreme Court and defense procurement. Clinton Library Papers, for example, reveal that the lone Senate objection to the Supreme Court nominations of both Stephen Breyer and Ruth Bader Ginsburg was from a lurking populist Ohio Democrat, Howard Metzenbaum, who opposed the future justice's general agreement with Bork on competition policy. In response to the end of the Cold War, the administration restructured the defense industry, shrinking the number of prime defense contractors from 107 to 5. The new defense industrial base, now concentrated in the hands of a few executives, stopped subsidizing key industries, and the, electron and the electronics industry was soon offshored. So, I mean, it's just this picture of, of the changing, you know, world economy, right? With the repeal of Glass-Steagall, uh, you know, allowing banks to do basically whatever the hell they want with your money, uh, expanding trade through NAFTA, welcoming China. So basically, you know, continuing this, this program of globalization and, and you know, uh, forcing American workers to compete with workers all over the world in these uh, who are able, who, who these trade agreements are able to, you know, sort of force into not great uh, agreements. And then, uh, you know, changing the defense industry from 107 competing contractors to five, right? So all of this stuff, good for big business, bad for small business, bad for workers, and, you know, uh, good for now for the economy of the country, but, you know, let's see how that goes. But who could argue, right? The concentration of media and telecommunications companies telecommunications companies happened concurrent with an investment boom into the newest beacon of progress, the internet. The futurism, the political coalition of the multi-ethnic cosmopolitans, the social justice of the private centrally planned corporation, it worked. Clinton's third way went global as political leaders abroad copied the Clinton model of success. A West Wing generation learned only Watergate baby politics, never realizing an earlier progressive economic tradition had even existed. Despite this prosperity, in 2000, the American people didn't reward the Democrats with majorities in Congress or an Oval Office victory. In particular, the rural parts of the country in the South, which had been a traditional area of democratic strength up until the 1970s, were supposedly were strongly opposed to this new Democratic Party. So this is this is the idea of the Solid South that I, I uh, had meant to talk about but hadn't really. That you know, again, after the civil rights, so the the South was as we talked about, right? The Republicans were sort of riding this high after the Civil War, and the Democrats had the Solid South. Uh, which was, you know, all the people who hated the Republicans because they were still pissed about the Civil, the civil War. So yeah, uh, between 1877 and the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the South is this solid Democratic voting bloc. Then in 1964, LBJ passes the, the Civil, you know, signs the Civil Rights Act. And there's this quote, I had this poli-sci professor in college who, who told us the story of this quote like five times. So it's like burned into my head is incredibly important. And it is, but maybe it's not quite as important as I think it is. But as he signs the, the Civil Rights Act, LBJ is supposed to have said, I am handing the South over to the Republicans for a generation or something like that. And, you know, turned out he was right. We now see the South, you know, not as this this strong base of power for the Democrats. And, you know, also we were talking about Wright Patman. He's from right in here. You know, a lot of these guys, they're, they're rural farm workers who, you know, have this sort of New Deal populist politics that, that were right at home in the Democratic Party until they switched to focusing on civil rights more than these economic issues, first with the Civil Rights Act, then with the Watergate babies. And then now the South is just the, you know, the solid South of the Republican Party, not of the Democratic Party. Uh, and white working class people whom Dutton had dismissed did not perceive the benefits of the greatest economy ever. They also began to die. <laughs> okay, that was an abrupt transition. Uh, yeah, they're being left behind the economy. They also begin to die. Starting in 1998 and continuing to this day, the mortality rate among white Americans, specifically those without a high school degree, has been on the rise, leaving them scared and alienated. Old problems also reemerged. 
Financial crises unseen since the 1920s began breaking out across the world, from Mexico to East Asia, prompted by hot money flows. Uh, what does this mean? What is hot money? In economics, hot money is the flow of funds or capital from one country to another in order to earn a short-term profit on interest rate differences and or anticipated exchange rate shifts. These speculative capital, flow, capital flows are called hot money because they can move very quickly in and out of markets, potentially leading to market instability. So I guess we're talking about basically like an arbitrage where, you know, money is moving from one place to another to take advantage of like different interest rates or, or exchange rate shifts. Sort of like day trading, but on like a macro level I guess where it's like oh well I expect you know the interest rate to go up over there so let me move my money over there and then oh now it's gonna be better over here so I'll move it over there and just sort of like really quickly moving this money around the world you know from one country to another uh, in order to take advantage of these minor little differences in, in interest rates or exchange rates deflation rather than inflation and a capital glut rather than a capital shortage started to concern policymakers and it turns out, according to a McKinsey study, that a disproportionately large amount of the productivity gains from the remarkable computerization of the economy were the result of just one company, Walmart, the new A&P. The megastore's economic influence reached levels not seen by a single company since the 19th century. The gains of the 1990s, it turned out, were not structural, but illusory. Early in Bush's term, the stock market bubble burst and wages collapsed. A few years later, a global banking crisis induced by a financial sector that had steadily gained power for 40 years erupted. Concentration of power in the private sector, it turned out, had its downsides. So, you know, just telling the story of uh, basically the Clinton administration. It seems like everything was great. They put into place all of these, you know, the reforms that they thought would be so great, freeing up business to do all these things. And it looks like it's great for a while, right? There's all this, this strong growth and all those stats we, we quoted a little bit ago, you know, showing how great the economy is. But it's not spreading out to everyone it's not reaching everyone the the you know and it it becomes this unstable system that is ultimately going to collapse in in 2008 and also 2001 with the dot-com bubble uh that section was really short i guess so you know what i'm gonna power through let's finish off this video in or this this series and this video right here let's move on to the final section here which i didn't look up because I uh, didn't think we'd be talking about it in this, so I have no idea what we're about to get to, but I'm pretty sure it's just the conclusion here. So by 2008, the ideas that took hold in the 1970s had been democratic orthodoxy for two generations. Left wing meant opposing war, supporting social tolerance, advocating environmentalism, accepting corporatism and big finance while also seeking redistribution via taxes. The Obama administration has been ideologically consistent with the Watergate baby's rejection of populism. And again, let's remember that he's writing this, you know, at the tail end of the Obama administration, right before the, you know, 2016 election, at a point where everyone is still assuming Hillary Clinton's coming up next. And, you know, we're just going to continue this on, uh, you know, inevitably forever, indefinitely forever. Uh, the Obama administration has been ideologically consistent with the Watergate baby's rejection of populism. Modern liberal political culture epitomizes Dutton's ideas, and it, its accomplishments are impressive. As late as 1995, a majority of Americans did not approve of interracial marriage, but today, gay marriage is the law of the land, and inter inter intermarriage rates? Is that really what we call that? Intermarriage? Anyways, interracial marriage rates are high and growing. Culturally, the United States is a far more tolerant and open society. So, you know, again, worth pointing out that that a big part of the, the Watergate baby thing was this turn towards these cultural, uh, you know, distinctions and, and, and fault lines as opposed to class dis distinctions and fault lines. And, you know, to their credit, they did achieve a lot of that, right? The, the, this, this, you know, gay marriage is the law of land. Interracial marriage, not even a thing anymore. Dealing with a financial collapse in the early years of his administration, Obama's political economic framework supported concentrated yet regulated financial power. From 2009 to 2010, the administration prioritized the stability of a concentrated financial system over risking an attempt to end the foreclosure wave threatening the American housing market. 
In the last seven years, another massive merger boom has occurred with concentrations accruing in the hospital, airline, telecommunications, and technology industries. Progressive corporations like Google are key pillars of a cosmopolitan liberal culture. This is the world of the Watergate babies and the libertarian and status thinkers who shape their intellectual understanding of it. But what intellectuals like Thoreau, Galbraith, Greenspan, Bork, and so forth didn't foresee was political disillusionment on a vast scale. In 2014, for example, voting rates in some states dropped to levels unseen since the 1820s when property franchise laws were enforced. So in 2014, voting rates in some states were as low as they were when only land-owning white men could vote. Meanwhile, American soldiers once again find themselves in a quagmire, this time in the Middle East. Despite their best efforts, U.S. institutions seem as out of control and ungovernable as they did when the 1975 class came into office. And this is kind of the interesting thing is because, okay, sure, they did a decent job with this, you know, tolerant open society thing. But the other part of their plan was to control government power, right? That was the other thing they believed they had to do. And as much as they freed up big business, they didn't really dismantle government power, right? Like the big government is, is bigger than ever. And it's just big business is bigger than ever too. And then now instead of having these countervailing forces, we have this intense regulatory capture of everything where we have big business and big government, which are right back together again, like they were, you know, when the Republicans were in power in the early 20th century, that leads to the Great Depression and all of that, right? Since so we were talking about how, how there's that alliance and, and so we had to break up the, the corporate power and, and that was what gave the Democrats power in the first place. Well, now we have the same situation where we have big government in cahoots with big business they're not keeping each other in check they're just you know spinning off into this vicious circle of of corruption and and graft and centralization and and you know what have you for most americans the institutions that touch their lives are unreachable americans get broadband through comcast they comcast their internet through Google, their seeds and chemicals through Monsanto. I'm assuming what he means here is that like, you know, they get like the way Google dominates like search traffic is that you get to whatever you want on the internet through Google. Cause he's talking about broadband and he's talking about internet. So that's the only way I can make sense of that. Uh, they sell their grain through cargo and buy everything from books to lawn mowers through Amazon. Open markets are gone, replaced by a handful of corporate giants. Political groups associated with Coke Industries have a larger budget than either political party, and there is no faith in what was once the most democratically responsive part of government, Congress. Steeped in centralized power and mistrust, Americans must now confront Donald Trump, the loudest and most grotesque symbol of authoritarianism in politics today. And that reminds me, I meant to, to say on this last point, you know, he was talking about uh, the political disillusionment and, and disaffected voters and all of that. And uh, boy, does he not know how right he's about to be proven with the 2016 election and, you know, everything that has come since. I don't know. It's an interesting question, I think. Have, have people gotten more politically disillusioned and, and disaffected since the 2016 election? Because on the one hand, I mean, there's this sort of like state of constant panic that we all find ourselves in where like everything is political and everyone is talking about politics like seemingly all the time. But on the other hand, there's also this sense of like, oh, it's just so fucked. Donald Trump is president. What are you going to do? Like the Democrats suck. The Republicans suck worse. Like, fuck it. It's all just dumb and, and no one wants to talk about it. So I, 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 I don't really know how to make sense of if political disillusionment has gotten better or worse since uh, he said this. But I think specifically disillusionment has to have gotten worse, right? With, with just the terrible state that everyone, like whichever side you're on, everyone thinks the government is in a like, crisis, terrible state right now. So that, that seems like disillusionment to me. This, wrote Robert Kagan in the Washington Post, is how fascism comes to America. The nation is awash in commentary and fear over the current cultural moment. America is a breeding ground for tyranny, wrote Andrew Sullivan in New York Magazine. Yet Trump's emergence would not be a surprise to someone like Patman or to most New Dealers. They would note that the real estate mogul's authoritarianism is not new in American culture. It is ubiquitous. It is consistent with how the commercial sphere has developed since the 1970s. Americans feel a lack of control. 
They are at the mercy of distant forces, their livelihoods dependent on the arbitrary whims of power. Patman once attacked chain stores as un-American, saying, We, the American people, want no part of monopolistic dictatorship in American business. Having yielded to monopolies in business, the nation must now face the un-American threat to democracy, which Patman warned they would sow. So yeah, I mean, I don't really have anything to add to that. That's a, a solid point, right? Is is everyone feels like it's basically what I was just saying. Everyone feels like Americans feel a lack of, or everyone feels a lack of control. They're at the mercy of distant forces, and and the water in which we swim, the intellectual water in which we swim, has no notion of of these New Deal ideas of breaking up monopolies, of of pitting you know corporate forces against each other. We live in this big government world, in this world where it's like big government or big big business which do you want you got to pick one and it's like well but they're both terrible and they're in cahoots and they're not these distinct countervailing forces that you imagine them to be it's it's you know we need this return to that new deal art idea he was presenting of of not big government taking on big business but on small government you know keeping business small as well so that you know a, an individual doesn't look around and see these giants surrounding him and think, oh shit, I'm useless and powerless against all these giant motherfuckers. It's like, oh, well, there's a business over there that's like, you know, of an understandable size to me. And we were talking about Walmart has, what was it, 2.1 million employees? There's like two companies that are flirting with trillion dollar valuations right now. I forget if either of them is currently at a trillion dollars, but like a trillion dollars, two million employees? I have no ability to conceive of that, let alone to conceive of how I could exert any sort of influence over everything. And that just leads to this vicious cycle too, of right? Of like, well, okay, fine. So we need to make government more powerful and you need to vote, right? Everyone's telling you, oh, go out and vote and you'll vote for government and government will keep this business in check, but then they don't. And so it's just this dissolution that just builds and builds on itself because there is no common conception of this idea of keeping power limited, keeping business in check, keeping government in check at the same time. We just see them as these, you know, countervailing forces that have to fight against each other and we're just collateral damage, you know, that that might get caught up along the way. How much more we got here? Okay, we still got like four more paragraphs left here. Americans have forgotten about the centuries-old anti-monopoly tradition that was designed to promote self-governing communities and political independence. The Watergate babies got rid of Patman's populism for a lot of reasons, but there was wisdom there. In the 1930s, Patman said that restricting chain stores would prevent Hitler's method of government and business in Europe from coming to the United States. For decades after World War II, preventing economic concentration was understood as a bulwark against tyranny. But since the 1970s, this rhetoric has seemed ridiculous. Now, the destabilization of political institutions suggests that it may not have been. Now, the destabilization of political institutions suggests that it may not have been. Financial crises are a regular feature of the U.S. banking system, and prices for essential goods and services reflect monopoly power rather than free citizens buying and selling to each other. Americans, Americans, sullen and unmoored from community structures, are turning to rage, apathy, protest, and tribalism like white supremacy. Ending the threat of authoritarianism is not a left-wing or right-wing problem, and the solution does not reside in big building a bigger or smaller government. Restoring political stability means structuring society's public and corporate institutions so they can be governed by human beings and communities. It means protecting the property rights of citizens and not confusing property with arbitrary toll booths erected by tech billionaires. And it means understanding that protecting competitive markets and preventing concentrations of power are essential components of democracy. I mean, I don't know. I kind of want to take this sentence by sentence here. Ending the threat of authoritarianism is not a left-wing or right-wing problem, and the solution does not reside in building a bigger or smaller government. I think this is really interesting because he's uh, he's sort of implicitly accepting this framing of big government versus big business and saying left-wing is big government, right-wing is big business, and that we need to, like, you know, shake that off. And first of all, his like I thought he had advanced his argument that that's not the way we should think of things, where it's big government versus big business, and that we should see them as these sort of interlocked things where you kind of have to keep both of them small, which is, I think, what he's going to argue in the next sentence. But to me, I, I've adapted this framework uh, uh, where left-wing 
and right wing and the point also the point i was gonna make is like even within this framework like right wing the right wing these days and again he was writing pre-trump right but even at this point he should have been able to see this coming the right wing is all about authoritarianism and the framework i currently use to understand left wing versus right wing is that left wing is about you know egalitarianism and, and equality and right wing is about hierarchy and authority and so to me, it is absolutely a left wing, right wing problem. The left wing is the ones who are arguing for what he's arguing for, for a, a dismantling of these massive hierarchies and these massive behemoths that are, you know, uh, create these hierarchies and authoritarian systems. And the left wing is saying, yo, fuck all that. Like, let's build a society where individual people are, you know, like capable of actually exerting influence on the system because it is not these, you know, giants running around. Restoring political stability means structuring society's public and corporate institutions so they can be governed by human beings and communities, right? And and to me, that is a, an, an extremely left-wing goal. I mean, there is this, like, there's, like, five old school Republicans left who are, you know, sort of libertarians and, and want, you know, like, and, and believe in, you know, the homestead, the Jeffersonian yeoman farmer ideal, but... You know, I, I, I don't think anyone takes them seriously, and I certainly don't, because what we have learned and what his point here is, is that if you do that, if you take that ethic, that libertarian ethic of, you know, small government and, and stay like, you know, trying to just stay out of the way, that business goes on and becomes big and, and we have these authoritarian situations that he's complaining about. So, again, I, I, I you know. I think it is a very left wing. It is. We need a left wing solution to it. Maybe I'm just a leftist, though. I don't know. It means protecting the property rights of citizens and not confusing property with arbitrary toll booths erected by tech billionaires. To which I think, I mean, he's just sort of saying that that with all of the monopolies we have out there these days, that you know, uh, that that business these days does not succeed by like offering a great product that people that you know people want to buy it, it succeeds by getting market power and then controlling the market and and you know extracting rents from anyone who wants to participate in that market and it means that protecting competitive markets and preventing concentrations of power are essential components of democracy for sure we've been over that a hundred times at this point Fortunately, Americans are beginning to remember what was once lost. Senator Elizabeth Warren often sounds like she's channeling Wright Patman. Senator Bernie Sanders stirred enormous enthusiasm in a younger generation more in touch with their populist souls. Republicans even debated putting antitrust back in their platform. President Obama has begun talking about the problem of monopolies. Renata Hess, the head of the government's antitrust division, recently gave a blistering speech repudi repudiating Bork's corporatist ideas. And none other than Hillary Clinton, in an October 3, 2016 speech on renewing antitrust vigor, noted that Trump, while a unique figure, also represents the broader trends of big business picking on the little guy. Restoring America's anti-monopoly traditions does not mean rejecting what the Watergate babies accomplished. It means merging their understanding of a multicultural democratic society with Brandeis' vision of an industrial democracy. The United States must place democracy at the heart of its commercial sphere once again. That means competition policy in force all the time at every level. The prevailing culture must be re-geared so that the republic may be born anew. I feel like he kind of fizzled there. I, I feel like he was really building this this whole like vision of how things ought to work, and then he's basically just boiling it. Eh, I guess he's you know he has boiled it down to anti-monopoly stuff, but I, I feel like I, I don't know. I, I feel like he's sort of just ca like gone for this simple synthesis of like okay, well we had the thesis of the New Deal, and we had the antithesis of uh, the Watergate babies, and now we need the synthesis of, of anti-monopoly populists who are pro-diversity and, and uh, you know, all that cultural stuff. But I feel like what he has really argued for in this piece is, is so much more than that. You know, it, it's this rethinking of, again, like the political water in which we swim. It's this realizing that, you know, it's not a choice between big business and big government. It's a, a requirement that we keep both small and, and you know, human scale. And it's it requires a, a, a rethinking of, you know, how those two things interact with each other, of, of what is good for business and what is, you know, bad about the state. And it, 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 what he has argued for is this like total revolutionary rethinking of, of you know, American political language and, and the basic ideology that is sort of like assumed and, and taught in schools and, and like, you know, 
again, I'm sorry, if you haven't seen it, there's this great um, David Foster Wallace graduation speech uh, where he just talks about this idea of this is water and like, you know, a fish doesn't realize that he's swimming in water, right? He just, it, it, the joke is like two fishes are, are swimming around and one fish says to the other, uh, boy, the water sure is great today. And the other fish goes, what's water? Because he doesn't know, water is everything. Water is air to us, you know, it, it's, it's or air to them. And that we have this this ideology, you know, that, that ideology just permeates everything. And and there are certain facts that we just take for granted that you just are assumed. And you know, like we talked in talked about in in the last series about uh, you know the the way so, like societies develop and the trade offs between inequality and scale and all that stuff. They are they are baked in to to humans raised in our society to the point where you can just throw them out without them being questioned, without anyone asking you for evidence. And that is ideology. That is, you know, one of the true powers in the world. There's this line from some, I think, like Scottish thinker that another of my favorite uh, writers, Ben Hunt, Epsilon Theory, quoted at one point. There's some Scottish guy, he said, uh, let me write the songs of a nation and I care not who writes its laws. And I don't, I don't, I, I could talk for hours about that quote. I've thought about it a lot. But the sort of fundamental idea it's getting at is that the fundamental ideas of a culture, these ideologies, these things that are taken as givens that, you know, are, that go unquestioned are the real power. And that, you know, you can come in and, and try to, you know, do whatever, do something. But if it goes against those, those uh, you know, prevailing notions, those ideological notions that underpin everything, you're not going to get very far. And that that is, that is kind of like my issue with that quote is like, Okay, but you know, writing the song like the people who get to write the songs of a nation, you know, are, are the the powerful people already, and they use that power to entrench their power, and that is the fundamental thing about power that he sort of he dances around in this article and and mentions a couple times, but doesn't really dive into, I don't think, in quite the way that he could have, which is that like power first and foremost uses itself to entrench itself. It, it uses the, the, the abilities that it has to make sure that no one can challenge it. And that is why power must be checked at every level. We have to keep government small and we have to keep business small because as soon as something starts getting bigger, it just, you know, it goes off the rails and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more unchallengeable and, and more and more untouchable. And we end up living in this world where we are just, you know, subjects to these authoritarian gods who seem inconceivably big. And what I think he has argued for is, is a revolution against that notion, against believing in any kind of power and in favor of checking all power everywhere, all the time, decentralization, you know, small government, small business, uh, and, you know, big people, I guess. So uh, I think of this as a, a phenomenal article, one of my favorite ones I've ever read, and I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Uh, I'm gonna be coming back with a, a real rough big one next. So uh, I, I'm gonna try to record it all tomorrow and then put it up in, in day by day in pieces from then on. So uh, hopefully you enjoy that one and look forward to it. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. Hopefully you're enjoying your life. Hopefully your entire world is full of joy and you know not what sadness even means. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna head out guys. So again, hope you enjoyed this. Hope you have a great day. I'll talk to you later. Take it easy.